Well, good morning and welcome to Frontiers in Oncology. We have a special seminar this morning. Dr. Robert Weymouth, who is the Robert Echo Swain Professor of Chemistry at Stanford is back with us. Um, We're incredibly excited for his talk today. We were so excited we've had an extra week to uh, anticipate it. Uh, Bob was with us last Tuesday morning and, and began his lecture and, and we had some technical issues with Wi-Fi and so um, we decided to reschedule so we could hear the whole uh, scientific story today uninterrupted. So I'll just briefly introduce Bob. He's known to many of you. Uh, Bob got his PhD from Caltech with um, R.H. Grubbs. He was a postdoc uh, with Professor Piero Pino at the ETH in Zurich and he's been at Stanford since 1988. Um, Bob has developed some really exciting new technology that um, allows gene delivery based on a new class of dynamic oligomeric cationic materials. And uh, this is um, just incredibly highly relevant for our life today. It's probably the most exciting and, and um, impactful technology that we're all thinking about because it's similar in concept to uh, how the new mRNA viruses and mRNA vaccines are being developed for uh, SARS-CoV-2. And I think he's not going to talk to us much about SARS-CoV-2 today, but instead about the potential for, um, for use in cancer, but um, I'm sure he'll be able to answer questions on that subject. So the title of his talk is Charge Altering Releasable Transporters, a new class of gene delivery agents for cancer vaccination. So welcome back, Bob. Okay, well, thanks very much, Steve. And I'd like to thank uh, Maria and Christina and um, the Stanford Cancer Institute for the opportunity to uh, uh, return today. Um, for those of you who were with us last week, I apologize. Hey. Uh, so thanks again. Uh, so again, today what I'd like to do is uh, describe um, some recent work we've been doing in developing a new class of materials that will uh, sequester genes like RNA, um, protect them, uh, transport them across cell membranes into cells, and then release the gene inside the cells so they can express proteins. Um, and so we call these charge altering releasable transporters and I'll walk you through a little of the chemistry um, that gives you an idea of why we call them that because that's how they behave. Um, and there was a note in the chat last week so I thought just, uh, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, we do have some funding from uh, Allergene Corporation and a number of patents that are pending on this technology. Um, so uh, I want to reiterate that this is a highly collaborative project between uh, our research group, uh, that of uh, Paul Wender and of Ron Levy. Um, and I want to thank all of them and their group members because um, it's really a testament um, to this team effort that we were able to get as far as we have been able to get. And it's just been a joy and a pleasure to work with not only uh, uh, Paul and Ron, but uh, their postdocs and students as well. So much of what I'll talk about is really a collaborative effort and I want to acknowledge them as I go through. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a um, highly collaborative project because the ultimate goal is to develop a class of functional materials that will act like a natural virus uh, to deliver genes into uh, particular cells or particular organs. And this involves a lot of chemistry where we've developed ways to make um, new kinds of polymeric materials. Uh, we teamed up with Paul who has a long history of working in drug delivery uh, to use these materials for drug delivery. And then the Levy group, of course, um, with expertise in molecular and cell biology and immunology. Um, we have a number of other Stanford collaborators uh, with whom we have worked and are working and so uh, this has really been quite an exciting program uh, that spans innovations in chemistry, uh, uh, polymer chemistry, organic chemistry, uh, cell and molecular biology and immunology. So uh, the point is we're trying to deliver uh, messenger RNA and use that as a therapeutic. Um, this has been long for, uh, known for some time but the real challenge is how to get the mRNA into the particular cell type or organ or tissue that you want. 
And I took a quote, I think, from uh, the CEO of CureVac. Uh, the general idea here is that rather than treat a patient with a drug, if you could send the message in such that you could co-opt the cell's own cellular machinery to make the biological protein that it could act as the therapeutic, um, you would have a new strategy for uh, protein replacement therapy or as well, we, as Steve just indicated, uh, vaccines, right? If you could deliver a messenger RNA that encodes an antigen, um, then the uh, body's immune system would uh, be elicited against that antigen and would provide a vaccine. Um, so um, there are several different ways. The big challenge is how to get mRNA into cells. Um, one of the ways this can be done is by mechanical methods. So electroporation is where you take a cell culture and you simply put a large uh, electric charge on it uh, to permeabilize the cell membrane, allow the gene to get in and then hope the cell membrane recovers. This is actually being practiced clinically right now. It works very well for ex vivo approaches, but it's more difficult to engineer in vivo. Um, then if you heard about the AstraZeneca vaccine for COVID, this is a adenovirus. You can use the actual biological machinery of viruses, take the gene that normally is in the virus out and put another gene in, and then use that uh, machinery to deliver the virus where you want. Um, and then the third method, which I'll focus on today, are non-viral methods, where you can um, basically engineer materials so that they have the same function as natural viruses. Package the gene, get the gene into the cell, release the gene either in the cytosol or the nucleus where you want. And so uh, today, uh, there are several non-viral methods, but the one uh, the one that's uh, advancing rapidly to the clinic, if you've followed uh, the news from Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna, these are called lipid nanoparticles. And so uh, these are now uh, first approved uh, by the FDA for alnylam um, for siRNA, interfering RNA technologies, and are now being used for the COVID vaccines. These lipid nanoparticles are a mixture, about a six or five component mixture, which has a cationic amine, which has a lipid attached to it chemically, mixed with a variety of phosphatidylcholines or other lipids, and lipids that have been functionalized with a polyethylene glycol and cholesterol. Complicated mixture, each company has their own proprietary formulations, but they work uh, very well, and um, they're being used right now and tested in phase three by both Pfizer and BioNTech. Um, these uh, things work and they're quite effective. Uh, they have some issues, uh, as you've heard. Uh, the persistent cations that are part of this cationic ionic lipid um, in some cases can be toxic, in other cases is naturally immunogenic. Um, and um, the formulations are rather complicated, but uh, nevertheless quite successful. But today what I want to tell you about is a completely different approach from lipid nanoparticles that we developed uh, as part of the team. And the story starts uh, several years ago when we teamed up with Paul Wender, who had been doing some amazing work in drug delivery, uh, where he'd reverse engineered the TAT peptide that is a polyarginine. Um, so arginine has these uh, guanidiniums on that. And we um, used some of that inspiration to make short cationic oligomers that had guanidinium groups um, and a short block that had a lipid component on it. And we wanted to deliver interfering RNA. So interfering RNA, as you well known from Andy Fire's uh, Nobel Prize, um, if that gets into the cytosol, it's usually a short, about 20 nucleotides, double-stranded, so 40 anions. Um, if you can get that into the cytosol and enable it to engage with the risk complex, you can catalytically degrade an mRNA for which it encodes and therefore knock down protein expression um, for the protein that's encoded by the mRNA corresponding to the uh, siRNA. And what we noticed is uh, we could actually deliver this if we simply took these short cationic oligomers, we co-formulated them with the siRNA, um, they form what's known as a coacervate nanoparticle. So a coacervate is a polycation and a polyanion, both of which are water soluble. When you mix a polycation and a polyanion, 
they make a separate phase and that's called a coacervate phase. So you simply mix these cationic um, amplifiles with the gene. You make these nanoparticles, which are about 300 nanometers in size. And if we introduce an siRNA that encodes uh, the red tomato protein and treat cells that constitutively express both red and green protein, we can knock down the red protein, but the green protein is still there, still being produced, the cells are alive, and we've effectively knocked down the protein. So this was a very exciting start in gene delivery between our group and the Wonder Group. And we then uh, decided, um, Paul was very excited to said, we should go after messenger RNA. And so we can make these materials with some chemistry I'll show you in a minute. And we decided we, it's probably not the same thing. mRNA is a much longer gene than siRNA, but we were naive and perhaps overconfident. And so we decided, well, we can make a variety of these ligamers to test them. So we probably made 50 of them and none of them worked. So you can buy a commercial reagent called Lipofectamine 2000. Um, and if you package a gene expressing uh, green fluorescent protein, the cells turn green. We made probably 50 versions of these short guanadinylated oligomers and none of them worked. Uh, this was about a year of frustration by joint students between my group and Paul's group, Colin McKinley and Jessica Vargas. And what we learned from that year of pain and frustration was that we were complexing the MR uh, mRNA. We were getting the mRNA into the cell but we weren't releasing the mRNA once it got in the cell and it was stuck in the endosome and it never got into the cytosol to engage um, the ribosome where it could be expressed into protein. So that was the lesson from that uh, initial study. And the solution to this study came out of left field. Um, in my group, another program, we had been interested in simply developing functional macromolecules with interesting properties. And Tim Blake, had shown that we could make these polymers that are simple polyesters. This is glycine, right? It's an N-hydroxyethylglycine polyester. So N-hydroxyethylglycine is a metabolite. If you're hyperglycemic, um, this will be in your urine. But nobody had ever made these monomers before, these morpholinones, and nobody had ever made these polymers before. And so Tim was just interested in the fundamental chemistry of these polymers, which we all suspected would have interesting properties, but nobody had ever made before. So it started out as a very fundamental project. And Tim was able to show that um, diethanolamine uh, is dirt cheap. It's in every shampoo. And so we could make these monomers with a catalyst that we had developed in our lab about 10, 15 years ago. So we have a scalable synthesis of the monomer. And over the last 20 years, we've been developing new catalysts. And so we have new catalysts that allow us to take these monomers and oligomerize them. And if you do that with a morpholinone that has a amine protecting group on it, you can now deprotect the amine and you make a water soluble cationic polyester that's derived from N-hydroxyethylglycine. Um, so that we published in 2014. But then Tim noted, if you put this polymer in water, it's stable for days in neutral water. But if you put it in buffered water, this polymer falls apart and it falls apart very selectively to this diketopiprazine. It's the dimer of dihydroxyethylglycine, of hydroxyethylglycine. And we spent some time trying to understand why this polymer falls apart the way it does. Most polymers, when they fall apart, give you a dog's breakfast of different oligomers of various lengths and shapes. And here we get an 85% isolated yield of this diketopiprazine. And this is triggered by pH. When the solution is acidic, the amines are all protonated. As soon as the pH starts to rise, some of these amines become basic. They become nucleophilic. It does this end o acyl migration, well known in peptide chemistry. But because of the unique structure of these polymers, as soon as you have one of these migrations, it positions this amine exactly six atoms away from that ester, and it cyclizes very efficiently to this uh, neutral um, uh, diketopiprazine. So when we made this observation, um, we 
at the parallel had been struggling with our gene delivery. And we had, well, it was actually a hope beyond the shadow of a dream um, uh, that we might be able to use this as a release mechanism. So while these cationic amplifiles are cationic, just like in our sRNA, we can mix them with mRNA and form these coacervate nanoparticles. If those lived long enough that they were able to get into the cell, then as the pH of the cell is pH seven, these things slowly start to protonate and degrade to neutral small molecules that would necessarily destabilize the coacervate and release the mRNA. Um, and so that's why we call them charge altering. They start cationic and they go to neutral, releasable because they release mRNA and transporters because they transport RNA into the cell. So this works. So if you look at a variety of cell lines now um, here, lipofectamine is the commercial positive control. And so if you look at a variety of cell lines and you deliver messenger RNA encoding green fluorescent protein, the cells are green, but only about 50% of the cells are green. Whereas if you use these carts from um, this uh, glycine derivative, um, all the cells are green, about 99% transfection efficiencies. Moreover, if you just look at cellular uh, viability assays at 10 times the treatment dose, the cells seem uh, quite viable. So this was a very promising development. Um, and so um, uh, the question is, why is it um, that these non-degradable cations don't work and the degradable ones do work? So uh, these, recall these uh, degrade of these carbonates. So we did some confocal microscopy where we could label the delivery vehicle with a Dansel dye. We could label the mRNA with a Psi-5 and that labeled mRNA with a Psi-5 also encodes green fluorescent protein. And so here is the outline of a cell. Um, and what you see is the cell is red. The cell is cyan we're getting our delivery vehicle and the mRNA into the cell, but the cell is not very green at all. Um, and if you look at dextran, which is an endosome staining dye, the punctate signal from the mRNA seems to be localized in dendosomes. Um, but if you use the CART, the degradable one, now the entire cell is green, the entire cell is red, uh, suggesting that at four hours after treatment, um, we've got the mRNA into the cell, the mRNA has found its way to the ribosome and has been able to express green fluorescent protein. So we think this mechanism of degradation is critical to this escape from the endosome and allowing the mRNA to get to the ribosome and the cytosol. Um, there's still some more work we need to do. Just prior to COVID, we were trying to use the new light sheet microscope over in uh, the medical school, and we were unfortunately shut down uh, for several months, as many of you well know. Um, so uh, we're very interested. This is a new kind of polymer, and this way that this polymer degrades is new. So we've invested quite a bit of effort to understand the fundamental chemistry of how fast does this thing degrade? How, what is the mechanism by which this degrade? So we've done a lot of kinetics. We understand a lot about this mechanism. It's a random mechanism that if you have a long polymer chain, this uh, one, two uh, migration happens randomly along the chain, not from the end to end. Um, and we can tune this rate of degradation based on the pH, but we can also tune the rate of degradation based on the structure. So our first generation one was made from glycine. You make a very simple chemical substitution and you make the exactly analogous polymer from alanine. And now the rate at which this falls apart is different. And you can tell from these curves that the mechanism by which they fall apart is different. Um, so I won't belabor this other to say that we can make these morpholinone monomers and the corresponding polymers from almost any amino acid. So we've developed the chemistry to do that. And this is chemistry, this is what we love. We can show that if you have an alpha ammonium polyester, it degrades at a much different rate than a beta ammonium polyester, alpha, beta, right? This is alpha. Um, and so the point to this slide is just to say that we know how these polymers degrade. We know how they polymer degrade as a function of pH and we can tune the rate at which they degrade. 
So our polymerization chemistry is also quite versatile. We can start from any alcohol that puts uh, an alcohol on the terminus of the chain. This is what's called a living polymerization. So if you wanna put 10 lipid, lipid repeat units, you just mix 10 monomers of lipid monomer with one alcohol initiator, and you on average get 10 repeat units of the lipid. Then you simply, once that reaction is done, you simply add the morpholinone monomer and you can put any arbitrary number of cationic groups on it. Um, so once you deep protect it and you have these amphiphilic um, uh, cationic materials, you can simply mix them with mRNA and you form these nanoparticles, which are about 200 nanometers in diameter. We don't really know what they look like. Uh, um, we're working with Wachu here at Stanford in the cryo EM and uh, with NIST, but we think these have a, a lipid fraction. That is, there's a certain volume fraction that's lipid and a certain volume fraction that's a highly hydrated polyelectrolyte phase, this coacervate phase of polycation polyanion. And so what I'll walk you through today is that we can change the nature of the uh, initiator. We can put dyes on there, as I've shown, but we can also put targeting ligands. I'll explain to you that the nature of the lipid influences what kind of cells it transfects and what kinds of organs it transfects. And the nature of the cation also influences what kind of cells it transfects and what kind of organs it gets into. And so there's quite a diversity of chemical space here. We haven't sampled all of the permutations, but I'll walk you through some of our ongoing studies right now. So our first generation cart, which was made from this dihydroxyethyl glycine, um, was very good in a variety of cell types, as I've shown you, but it was not very good in lymphocytes, T cells. So you may be aware that um, chimeric antigen T cell therapies and ex vivo cellular therapies are quite a, a lot of interest. And we, like many others, were unable to get high gene expression in T cells. So we could get very good gene expression in HeLa cells, but either the positive control, commercial control, or our first generation CART was not very good, less than 10% in jerk cats, which is an immortalized T cell line. Um, so here's where chemistry came to the rescue. Um, I told you we can make a variety of different of these materials. And our hypothesis was, um, would the nature of the lipid matter? We know different cell types have different li lipids on their surface. And at the time, it wasn't clear whether this lipid part had to be just hydrophobic or it really needed to be lipid-like. So we made eight different carts some of which simply had hydrophobic groups on them, and some of which had lipid-like groups on them, cholesterol, nonenol, uh, oleo, et cetera. And then we made eight different of these structures, and we decided to mix them in binary combinations. So we would take CART A and CART B in a two-to-one ratio, formulate that with mRNA, so one particle would have both CARTs in it. And then we would formulate that with now luciferase, uh, mRNA encoding firefly luciferase, and we could just simply look at a well plate and look at a heat map. Uh, the colors here represent the intensity of the luciferase signal. Um, and so what you observe is in the blue here is the normal signal we got from our first generation cart. Um, and as you go to yellow, you see a hot spot, which is a combination of the nonenol unsaturated lipid and the oleo unsaturated lipid. Um, and so uh, there's actually a lot more data in this data, but uh, that just told us that that combination was particularly good. And so now we go from less than 20% transfection in lymphocytes to greater than 80% 80 transfection in lymphocytes. And so this strategy um, of being able to test various combinations of CARTs in, in different cell lines um, has given us the idea that we may be able to develop materials uh, that would be selective for certain cell types over others, or where we could optimize the cell transfection in any given cell type. And here, I think you're gonna appreciate this. This is a big data problem. This is what I just showed you in Jercat cell lines. So that's three replicate experiments with 56 unique data points and we did that in seven different cell lines. 
Um, so there's a huge amount of data here. And I have an amazingly talented undergraduate, Isaac Applebaum, who has been able to map all that data. But now what we're doing with Grant Roshkoff is we're using uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques to try to see if we can correlate how does the structure or identity of the cart that we use influence the type of cells that get transfected. And Grant and Isaac have been able to show that they could develop a neural network and there is a mathematical functional relationship between the CART inputs and the type of cell selectivities we use. And so we're using this to generate additional hypotheses, both to optimize um, transfection efficiency in different cell types and to predict and hypothesize what new CARTs might we make uh, to improve selectivity in any particular cell line. Okay, so one cell line that is of interest are natural killer cells. And so uh, Aaron Vilk in um, uh, Catherine Blish lab approached us and worked with Nancy Benner in Paul Wenders lab. And they were trying to deliver genes into natural killer cells and they were using electroporation. They saw very poor transfection efficiency with electroporation, but the other problem with NK cells is they're very tricky cells. And as soon as you electroporated the cells, the phenotype of the NK cells just went haywire. And so we were able to show that if we used our uh, first generation CART, we could get about 10% transfection efficiency of green fluorescent protein. With our mixed lipid CART, we could get up to 30% transfection of GFP. Um, and in this case, we did not change the NK cell phenotype. So we could deliver the gene without doing it. And so then uh, paired up with Ron Levy's lab, ULA in Ron's lab, generated a messenger RNA to encode both mouse and human chimeric antigen receptors against CD19. And we were able to show that we could generate chimeric antigen receptor NK cells. And those NK cells would exhibit a cytotoxic phenotype against uh, cells that express uh, the CD19 antigen. Um, so that was really quite promising. And I think gives you an idea of, of even in ex vivo cell therapies, this might have um, uh, an interesting uh, opportunities there. So those were sort of ex vivo, but this also works in vivo. So if we take um, uh, firefly luciferase and we formulate it with our cart and inject it intramuscularly into a live mouse, you see the mouse is now glowing like a firefly. The bioluminescence shows that we're getting mRNA expression, protein expression about four hours after injection and then it slowly decays over the period of about 48 hours. This is what you'd expect for mRNA. mRNA will catalytically generate protein, but it slowly gets turned over in the cell. So you can actually dose it like a drug, um, but there's still some more pharmacokinetics to work out. Um, so if you do an intramuscular injection on the left flank here, we'd injected naked mRNA and you can see it's barely above background um, where we're getting quite robust expression intramuscularly. If you inject it intravenously, we see uh, luciferase expression in the spleen, about 99% in the spleen. Now, this is very interesting because the lipid nanoparticles will typically, typically go to the liver. And so this was kind of unique to these carts. We have very high spleen selectivities. Uh, when Ron first saw this initial picture, um, he got quite excited. And that was what stimulated our, our long running collaboration with the Levy Group. Um, so uh, here you see as little as one hour after injection IV, we're getting signal in the spleen. Um, and we're still uh, trying to understand this, but the types of places you get it um, depends on the mode of administration. So subcutaneous, intraperitoneal, intramuscular, IV, intratumoral. We even see some expression if we do topical administration. So we're still trying to understand the rules for the biodistribution of this, but it influenced by both the nature of the cart and the mode of administration. So here's an example where our first generation cart goes 99% uh, to the spleen, okay? Whereas if we simply change the nature of the cation and we do IV administration, now we're about 75% to the lung. And in the last few weeks, Rebecca has some new carts that will go 90% to the lung upon IV injection. Um, you then take another cart structure where you mix two different carts with different cations, and we get systemic 
expression of luciferase uh, all over the mouse, including the brain. And uh, Adrian Salwetz has done some beautiful work in Ron's group. If you perfuse this mouse and remove the blood, um, the signal goes down. And we have evidence that we're getting mRNA expressed in reticulocytes and they, the protein stays expressed in red blood cells. Um, so very exciting development. And of course, in the spleen, you can then start to phenotype the types of cells uh, that are expressing mRNA in the spleen. And you can see T cells, B cells, dendritic cells, monocytes, um, et cetera. And so we're still, this is a work in progress. We're still trying to understand what kind of cell types get transfected for what types of organs get transfected. But this ability without even putting any targeting ligands on these um, to target different organs is I think quite unique and very exciting. So in the last couple of minutes, what I'd like to do now is say, okay, this is a, um, an immunological seminar, the Cancer Institute. Um, so with Ron Levy, we've now tried to ask, can this approach be used to generate uh, vaccines against cancer? So our first attempt was to develop an mRNA approach where the mRNA would encode a non-mouse uh, cancer-specific antigen. And so we took a model system, which is an A20 lymphoma model, which when implanted subcutaneously creates a palpable tumor. And that um, lymphoma was uh, genetically engineered to express the non-mouse protein OVA. And so in this particular case, it was a therapeutic vaccination approach where we uh, implanted the tumors and allowed the tumors to grow for seven days. And then we would um, inject by IV or sub Q um, an mRNA that encoded the, OVA, the entire OVA protein. Um, and then as well, Ron has a lot of experience with adjuvants. In particular, CPG is a short oligonucleotide that's a TOL9 uh, agonist and an adjuvant. And because it is a polynucleotide, we can co-formulate it with the mRNA in one particle. So the mRNA and the adjuvant get into the same cell types. And if you do that, um, the red mice are the control mice and all 10 of those had to be sacrificed out of 30 days. But of the, we gave three, three microgram doses uh, to the mice starting at day seven. Um, and what you observe is we get an 80% survival rate, but more impressive, I think, in eight of the 10 mice, not only do we see tumor regression, we see tumor eradication. The tumors go away. And this was done both by measuring the tumor and having the tumor express luciferase. Um, so that's quite exciting. It suggests that we're, and we know in, in this paper that we're getting a cytotoxic T cell response that's uh, part of the origin of this immunological response. Um, but if it's a, a T cell response, it should be protective. And so in this case, we did a simultaneous vaccination at the same time that we implanted the tumor. Under those conditions, we get 100% survival rate. But now we wait 30 days and we re-challenge the mice with the tumor without the vaccine. And in that case, we get 100% uh, survival. Okay, so here are the control tumors upon re-administration and the mice that were pre-treated with the vaccine um, uh, showed no tumor whatsoever. So that was quite exciting. We published that a couple of years ago. Um, one of the challenges here, as many of you will know, this was just a model system, but in any case, um, if you're going to use an antigen, a neoantigen strategy against cancer, the problem is you may not know what the antigen is. Um, so on the antigen presenting cell, you're taking some fragment of a protein uh, to present to the T cell receptor. Um, but you may not know what that neoantigen is, or even if you deep gene sequence the patient. Uh, you want an antigen that's non-self, so you don't stimulate an autoimmune disease. Um, but you may not know of those neoantigens that are unique to the cancer, which ones are the mostly immunogenic. But as many of you will well know, and it's not my place as a chemist to explain immunology, um, the uh, immunological synapse between the antigen presenting cells and the T cells is not just the T cell receptor in the MHC, but there are many other. It's a very nuanced conversation between the antigen presenting cell and the uh, T cell. 
And some of those interactions are immunostimulatory and some of them are immunosuppressive. And since I'm a chemist and not an immunologist, I like to think about these as eat me signals and don't eat me signals. Um, so you may be familiar with checkpoint therapies. PDL1 is one of these don't eat me signals, which is responsible for why cancer tumor microenvironments are immunosuppressive. And so if you get an antibody that will bind PDL1, a checkpoint inhibitor, um, you can mitigate that immunosuppressive response, upgrade the tumor uh, response, and kill the cancer. But another approach is to take the immunostimulant, the tumor microenvironment, and use that to stimulate the immune response in the tumor itself. And so this is where Ron's genius came uh, to be. Uh, what immunostimulatory agents might you choose? There are a variety of which you could choose from. And we picked, uh, based on Ron's insights, he'd worked with OX40L. And so we picked a candidate case of immunostimulatory agents. And the design of the experiment here is to in have a two tumor model, A20s on both sides of the mouse, where we're gonna inject one tumor and then we're gonna watch what happens to both tumors. So we're only gonna inject one tumor with a dose at seven days, 11 days, and 14 days after we establish the tumors in the mice. And uh, here are the results from that experiment. Uh, what you observe is that in the tumor that was treated, we see a complete regression of the tumor if it's treated with a cocktail of three different mRNAs. So here, Ola was able to make mRNAs that encoded OX40, CD80, CD86, and we co-formulated all three of those mRNAs into a single nanoparticle, and that was injected into the tumor. And so what we observe is a regression of the tumor that we injected, but also uh, in the other tumor on the other side of the mouse, uh, here the control mice here, um, we see um, that we've slowed down the um, uh, development of the cancer in that other tumor as well. And the OX40, CD80, CD86 combination was better than OX40, IL-12, or OX40 and IFN-alpha, gamma rather. Um, and so here the survival rate wasn't quite as good, but I think you can appreciate that this is quite an exciting strategy and it's part of some ongoing efforts that are going on in, in Ron and our lab uh, today. This intratumoral injection is quite a promising approach. Um, moreover, this seems to be tumor microenvironment specific because if you have two different tumors, A20, CT26, you inject the A20 tumor, the A20 tumor goes down, we see no effect on the CT26. That suggests that it's a systemic response that's specific to the tumor and microenvironment that's been injected. Um, and I should point out that uh, right after this paper came out, uh, the Moderna crew um, used a similar approach using their lipid nanoparticles, but they chose a slightly different cocktail of uh, in, 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 immunomodulatory agent mRNAs that they injected with their lipid nanoparticles. And um, since we can put dyes on these, we can watch where the delivery vehicle goes, we can watch where the mRNA goes, and we can watch where the mRNA is expressed. And what we observed here by watching where the delivery vehicle goes is it was quite local. When we do an intratumoral injection, uh, the uh, gene delivery agent goes only in the tumor that's injected with just a little leakage into the draining lymph nodes. We see no amount of the cargo in the distal tumor, even though we have a systemic response. Um, and if you phenotype the type of cells in the injected tumor, about 30% of all the A20 cells are transfected, but also CD4, CD8s, dendritic cells, and macrophages. Um, so again, very promising approach here for two different approaches for using mRNA for cancer vaccination. Um, and both of these programs are, are continue to be developed in our labs. Um, so with that, I think I'm running out of time. And I will uh, simply, I, I wanted to leave time for questions. I want to acknowledge the uh, heroic efforts of really a very large team, not only in my group, uh, but in Paul Wender's group and Ron Levy's group. Um, it's really been a delightful um, collaborative project. Um, so the people in red are both present and former students and postdocs who've worked on this project. Uh, just extraordinary set of collaborators. 
um, uh, funding from the National Institute of Health, NSF, um, also Allergene. And um, uh, here's a picture of my group pre-COVID. Um, I only have one picture of my group all in mass post-COVID, uh, but I'll stop there and be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you, Bob. Really extraordinary um, se uh, seminar in technology. So uh, I think you all know to put questions in the Q&A box. And our first one comes from Nathaniel Gray, who asks, have you tried to deliver negatively charged small molecules like cyclic dye GMP sting agonists? Um, that, Nathaniel, that's a great question. And so we haven't uh, tried to deliver that particular target. Uh, but these delivery vehicles are quite promiscuous. And Paul Wender showed with our joint student, Colin McKinley, that we can deliver inositol hexaphosphate. This is an incredibly anion dense small molecule. And so I think there's every reason to believe that uh, cyclic DiGMP sting agonists. So we've been able to do everything from uh, self-amplifying mRNAs that are about 10,000 nucleotides long to uh, short siRNAs um, to even, um, you know, locked nRNAs. So we haven't tried that particular one, but I have every reason to believe that it could work. Great, thanks. I have a question. So if I understood, um, yeah, you're, you're mixing and matching these aliphatic or hydrophobic um, side chains, right, in, in your, in your um, carrier, your, your liposome particle, and then you're getting these different distribution patterns within the animal. When, when you had that animal that had the broad distribution, was that, that was from red blood cells or reticulocytes, so that when you washed that out, that signal went away? Is that right, or? The didn't completely go away, ah. uh, but in fact, it went away, and Adrian's done just beautiful work to show that you can watch the evolution of protein expression from the reticulocytes into the red blood cells. So red blood cells have no ribosome, right? So, so we are clearly getting the mRNA in in one of the <clears throat> progenitor cells. This was just an IV injection. Um, and so we are co-opting the machinery that exists in the pro progenitor cells. And then the protein remains expressed in the red blood cells as they mature. And it seems like you have an infinite possibility of combining these different groups. You focused on a, on a small number of them, but is the sky the limit for synthesizing different side chains and combining them and testing distribution yeah, patterns? Yeah, it, it is in, in something I didn't talk about, um, but this is where I live. We actually have developed a synthesis robot it's based on a flow reactor, a fluid flow reactor. Mm. So we can make libraries of these carts very, very rapidly. Mm. Um, and so that was actually some joint work we did with IBM. But um, so we are trying to push the chemistry, uh, the process chemistry, and the biology. But the answer is yes, we can make a lot of these things. We think we'll be able to make a lot of them very quickly. And now we need rapid assays. And that's why I hinted at our data science problem because we're gonna be generating so much data that we need to be able to interpret that data to figure out um, how we're getting maximal transfection. And so that's project right now, the data science is focused on the cellular assays, but you could imagine a similar approach um, in vivo. I guess the limiting factor there is actually putting those into animals, all those combinations into animals. And that's interpreting right, results, and that's right? a slow step, right? Because if you've mm -hmm. got to mm -hmm. sack the mice and take out the organs and phenotype every cell type, it's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. quite a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Nathaniel has another question, which is, what are your thoughts on targeting ligands? Are there go-to ones for certain cell types already established? Um, yes, that's a kind of an ongoing project now, but, um, uh, we have, uh, uh, and we haven't focused so much on it yet, primarily because the observations we're seeing when we're not targeting are surprising the heck out of us. And so we're trying to figure out just what are the physical chemical properties that dictate where it goes. Um, but yes, we're um, uh, certainly carbohydrate ligands are high on our radar screen. 
but there are a number of others um, with collaborators here at Stanford that we're engaging with right now to come up with some very creative new types of ligands that will target different organs and cell types even within an organ. The chemistry Great. is quite flexible. I have another question, which is what is the upper limit of the cargo size for the mRNA? What is, is it limited by size? Is it limited by what you can actually synthesize or, or what's the limit? Limitation um, there. It's a good question and we don't know. So Nancy working with Chris Contag before he unfortunately went to Michigan State uh, showed that we could deliver um, plasmids and we needed a slightly different vehicle to optimize for plasmids versus mRNAs. But we could get, we did a um, Sleeping Beauty transposon system where we were able to introduce two different plasmids and some of those plasmids were up to 10,000 nucleotides. Mm. So, um, uh, so we don't know what the limits are. And partly, that's a fascinating question from the polymer and coacervate physics, right? Just mm. how mm. big of a polyanion can you sequester into these unusual coacervate phases? I had another question about that because I hadn't heard the term coacervate before, but um, the way you described it, it it's, 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 a, it's a phase separated uh, entity. Is that right? That's right. So, so if you're familiar with P bodies or nucleosomes, sure. biology uses this for membraneless organelles. So, and so many of the membraneless organelles are intrinsically disordered proteins that are cationic that mm -hmm. bind to genes. And that's how the spliceosome works. Right, it's not in a membrane or organelle. It's in a coacervate organelle, and that doesn't create problems from the from the delivery perspective, the therapeutic delivery we perspective. Don't know, right? Uh, there are all these dead box helicases, and in fact, we're working with Dan Jarosz on a separate NIH project where we're trying to really understand the chemistry, physics, and biology of these membraneless mm -hmm. organelles. And mm -hmm. it may very well be because you have these P bodies and various things. Then the dead box proteins, for example, that are that you know sequester and degrade mRNA. Uh, they the physics of our particles is very similar to those, mm. and it's an open question as to whether we're expressing all the mRNA we're getting in because of these other effects that are going on in the cell. I see. Um, Any so other questions? Micronucleate proteins in the chat. So um, yeah, Nancy and Paul's group has shown that we can actually, if you bind the guide mRNA to Cas9, that RNP is anionic, and we can deliver that RNP as well. So we've also delivered mRNA with the guide in one particle and completely reconstructed the Cas9 machinery inside the cell. Can I ask um, to bring it back to the uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine um, topic? How does your uh, lip liposome particle or um, nanoparticle technology differ from what's being used by Pfizer and and Moderna? And what do we do? We know much about their tissue distribution patterns in terms of how they're where they're delivering their spike protein mRNA in vivo. Yeah, so uh, based on the published literature, um, they tend to get high liver specificity. So they're delivering a lot of these particles in the liver. And with uh, some of the ones that we're looking at, we get it into the spleen. Um, so there's more immune cells in the spleen. So there's some differences. Um, but it, I, 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 say, I should say we have not done a head-to-head -head comparison, partly because a lot of theirs are proprietary. It's hard sure. to get I imagine yeah. uh, we would love to do that to actually test them side by side. Um, but the chemistry and physics are very different and we're already seeing different organ selectivities. Um, mm -hmm. And how that plays out in the molecular biology and the cell biology of COVID vaccine is still to be determined. Um, Got it. Really exciting. Any other questions from the audience? Well, I think this was incredibly thought-provoking and stimulating for everybody, you know, wanting to 
adapt this technology for important biological questions that we're tackling in our labs or in our groups or with our patients. So um, thank you, Bob, so much. This is a really fantastic yeah, seminar. Delighted to talk to any of you. We're, we're quite enthusiastic about working with people because it's, uh, it's, it's really exciting and Stanford is really a phenomenal place for doing this. So um, I really appreciate your giving me the opportunity to share some of our own excitement about uh, this project with everyone. That's great. Very exciting. Thanks so much for your talk. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a nice Thanksgiving. Do we have a next? Oh, we do. Okay, so Tuesday, when we come back from Thanksgiving, 8 a.m., Hashem El Sarag, uh, who is the chair of the Department of Medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine, will um, give a talk on contemporary epidemiology of hepatocellular carcinoma in the United States. So please join us for that and have a wonderful holiday weekend. Thank you. Yeah, best wishes to all. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Yes, bye-bye.